Father in heaven, I'm asking you to bless us, guide us by your spirit, in the name of Jesus. So we're talking about depression, and the number 10 hit was frontal lobe. This is a complex one. And music plays a big part in it. If we took a survey of Shalet and divided people on the basis of the music that they listen to and the amount of music they listen to, like the amount of time, you would find some groups with major depression and some groups with little depression. Some things about music have changed in the last hundred years. Uh, up till recently, <coughs> the volume of music had to do with how close you are to it. There were no electrical speakers, no megaphones. So when people sing, the volume comes from their voice. When they play the harmonium, it comes from the air that's being pumped. Uh, when the speakers became common, and you can put those in your ears, you can now play music easily that is loud enough to damage your ear. That wasn't even possible 100 years ago. No one got ear damage by going to a concert. Do you understand what I'm saying about the volume? So, so this is a big change. The second thing is that up until 100 years ago, music was something that was personal most of the time. Let me say it differently. Most of the music you had a hundred years ago was the music you yourself would sing. You might go to a concert once a week. Uh, you might go to, to a place like a church uh, occasionally. But in your own home, you didn't hear very much music. You heard the birds sing. You heard the insects. But unless you're singing, there's not really any music. So in a typical week, you might hear music for two or three hours. But what about now? You probably know people who listen to music three or four hours a day. Some people sleep listening to music. But you could listen to music even 20 hours in a week. This is a big change. So the speakers in the time have uh, change the power of music to impact people. I mean, a hundred years ago, music could cause this much damage. Now the music is listened to many more hours during the week. 
and it's much louder. So even though the music may not have changed in quality, it's changed in power. You understand what I mean so far? Just by these two things. Uh, I sing all the time. When I'm walking down the road, I'll sing. But my music is just my own voice, it's never very loud. So let me get back to what I was telling you uh, yesterday. Music has three parts. Melody, harmony, and rhythm. And these uh, relate to our bodies in different ways. The melody relates mostly to our thoughts. The harmony mostly to our emotions. And the rhythm mostly to our physical drives. About 70 years ago, uh, Western people began to listen to what's called rock music. Uh, rock music began to make a science of how to use rhythm to affect people physically. One of the most comforting sounds to your mind is the sound of your mother's heartbeat. Or a father's heartbeat. When you hold the baby's head to your chest, and he hears that pump sound. That's a very comfortable sound to him. And a wholesome music follows a pattern related to that sound. I uh, I don't know if you know anything about music, but I'm going to pretend you know something. Uh, if we talk about music, the timing might go one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. Is that a familiar idea to you to, uh, to look at the timing of music like that? So the natural rhythm that your body is accustomed to hear has an emphasis on one and three. So like this. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. This is the natural rhythm that your body is accustomed to hear. What they learned 60 years ago is when they start that rhythm, start the rhythm, they can add an off beat and make it louder, and that really stimulates the body. It might be on two and four, or one and a half and three and a half. 
If you play these kind of music out loud, on the one and three music, if it's quite majestic, people will get a feeling to like march. They kind of move their arms and legs quite naturally to that music. But on the two and four music, they tend to move the hips. And you can even see this in little children listening to the music for the first time. It's those off, off rhythms that end up causing those strong physical urges. And that makes it harder to make principled decisions. So if you make religious music, but you put those rhythms in it, you make a strange message. The words say, do the right thing. And the music says, do the wrong thing. But the music pushes harder. So the rhythms can be used to create anger. Even violence. Sensuality. Uh, hunger. Uh, your stores, the large stores, will use music to increase your buying habits. They're just they're just doing it to get money. But it's at expense of your mental health. Now my arm has bones. But you don't see the bones. But they're still important. They give structure to the hands. In the same way, when you play on the guitar, uh, there's rhythm to any song you play. Even when I sing, there's rhythm to the song I sing. If you play on the harmonium, there's rhythm. But the rhythm isn't a sound. It's a it's the timing of it. When it becomes a sound is when it begins to really drive the physical uh, parts of your body. This is why at Be Well we don't use the drums. Because those drive the physical drives. And that is a frontal lobe hit. So I've been teaching about this for 30 years. And I've had many students who did not believe it. And I could watch them over the course of five or ten years. And the results are always the same. They move further away from the truth as they hold on to the music. I drew a picture for you yesterday. I said that of the music that is being sold, 
the great bulk of it is that VP music. Let me see if I can play for you a song that has no um, has no rhythm on the outside. It has rhythm used for emphasis in some places, but no, no drum keeping the time. That music had one and three all the way through it. To your mind, it feels natural. But not stimulating. If a drum had been added to it, the drums would not have been on the same emphasis as the music. They would have been on the two and the four. That would completely change the way your body feels the music. Uh, that's what we talk about when we talk about the frontal lobe get from music. So, I could say more about that, but I think that's enough for now. I suggest to you, if you listen to music, limit yourself to a couple hours a week. Don't play it very loud. And don't listen to music that has the bones on the outside, that has the, the drums connected. And then the music will be helping you. Do you have any questions about this topic? And then the music will be helping you.
Do you have any questions about this topic? You mean like sentimental, um, traditional music? The drums were not part of Christian music 60, 70 years ago. They were part of the worldly entertainment. And it wasn't because the church was becoming closer to God that it let that kind of rhythm into the church. It wasn't because the church was getting closer to God. I'll say it positive. The church was getting far from God, and that's why the rhythms came into the church. I think four of you come from a Hindu background. Are you from a Hindu background, Jonas? Jonas. Right, so the Hindu dances uh, are all based on these rhythms that I'm telling you are dangerous. And when you ladies were doing those Hindu like dances, there's a lot of movement of the hips. And uh, that is the kind of music that we'll never have as, as part of you well. Okay. Any other questions before I go on? Many people say that if the ground is not there while singing the Christian song, then it doesn't match the, the rhythm. So you've experienced be well. We sing here without the drum. How is the rhythm? Uh, it's just a, a nonsensical argument. The Ujurang, it's true that we need more teaching here about how to sing. When I was with the children yesterday, I'm teaching them a song. They began to sing it too loud. But when they get too loud, they get off tune. It's a normal result in the human voice. So I had them get quiet. And when they sing quiet, they sing on tune. When you're taking music lessons, you might have a meter, a machine that keeps time for you. Until it becomes quite natural for you. Um, did that answer your question? I forgot the question. Yes.
There's two categories and thousands of types. I don't know if I want to teach you this much about music theory. When I was describing for you the one, two, three, four, that's just one type, one type of timing. There's also a six eight timing that's quite different. And uh, Satan is always investigating how to make a new rhythm that will stimulate people to to be out of control. But if you want to know what God thinks about music, as the sun comes up, go outside and just listen. You'll hear the birds. They're singing. They don't use drums. They just sing the melody. And it gives you an idea of the way God intended music to be. I'd say good singing is like the music of the birds, soft and melodious. Jonas, it looks like you don't like this lecture. Do you like the BT music? It's an addiction. It's a stimulation. And when you have that stimulation routinely, and then the stimulation stops, you feel very empty. I was in India about 12 years ago. I was teaching people about the danger of hot spices. They had been using them all their life. Although when you give hot spice to a baby, he will cry. But by one or two years old, he's learning. So we took everyone off of hot spice. And in the same day, they all became constipated. What was happening? If someone is, if you keep someone from going to sleep by slapping them, a man is here, and every time he starts to go to sleep, I slap him. And I keep him awake for two days. There'll come a point where if I stop slapping him, he will go to sleep instantly. Uh, that's what was going on with the gut. It was constantly irritated. It needed a break. And when the irritation stopped, it went right to sleep. There was no movement. So I explained to them they'll have to go slow. But for music and alcohol and caffeine and porn, masturbation, you don't go slow. You deal with it right now. Because these are dopamine addictions. And any one of them can keep the other ones active. So I have a pity for people in this country. Because the men want to stop using porn. 
but they listen to music that keeps pushing their physical drives. It, it makes it hard for them. So what I say to them, I say that music doesn't force you to do the wrong thing. But you already have a hard time. You don't need a harder time. So be done with the music already. Do any of you play an instrument? What do you play? Guitar. You play the guitar. Do you have one here? Not here. And what do you play? Harmonia. Harmonia. Okay, good. And I think as a school we should get a guitar and a harmonia. I also play the guitar and the piano. And it would be good for us to have some music where you could feel how the proper music goes. Uh, Jonash, I don't want to get much into science, but if you want more science, I can give it to you later. Uh, I think I had um, Joey to translate something from Ellen White about this. There is information there about how Satan uses music. And about how especially he would use it at the end of time. Have you seen that statement? Does it sound familiar? I'll get it today and send it to the student group. Maybe as soon as we're done with class. So we've had lots of questions on this topic. Is there any more before I go on? Amar Prasnolo Mane Zidu is a musical musician. A divino church in Bangladesh, that is Christian again. She should take a decision of Koshana Kore, Tara on a Lafayla Page, Mizibulu, Gamba, and Bukore. They were given us the Bible for the Kirikum, the class, the Kirikum. Many churches in Bangladesh receive the feeling of having music and jumping, singing, and a lot of. Energy, they say. But what does Bible say about this? Uh, the Bible is very clear about worship. Uh, God is looking for a holy heart. He's looking for an engaged mind. And when we are stimulated, when we're excited, we don't think very well. It's really easy for Satan to confuse people at those times. I'll send you that statement to everyone. It's the same statement that I mentioned a moment ago. If I went to a church and they were playing heavy music and people were standing up and moving around, I would walk out. When I was in India and they wanted to do that, but they wanted me to speak, I said, You must stop the music or I will not be speaking. I'm not going to have the music pushing one way while I push the other way. Yes. Some people, some teachers, they really be like, okay, so now this is the time for like calling out things. So when they start saying this kind of thing, uh, from behind, some people love to play, start playing music. It's almost spiritualism. Yeah. Uh, so I think 
Christianity in Bangladesh isn't very Christian. So that's too bad for all of you. Because none of you really came from a Christian background. So you haven't seen a lot of what real religion is like. But at least I'm able to explain it to you. And you experience part of it here. Are you ready to go to another topic? It's a deep topic. Yeah, it's a deep topic. Yeah. Um, what is the opposite of what we have been watching and all? When we go to the this isn't just a Christian topic. Music is a big part of the Hindu religion. A big part of worship. The dances are a big part of the uh, idolatry. And um, the music that came in 60 years ago came in from spirit worship. Have any of you ever known someone that was possessed by a spirit? Have you ever seen one like that? So it's not too rare. But this BT music began in Africa as a way to cause this to happen. That is, it was rituals to lead to this result that involved the first use of drums in religious music. Africa is and there was a preacher who came to Swaziland and then he was like teaching us. He was like, Why don't you fly when you are singing? You should sing with all your heart. And he was from Brazil. And then he came from Brazil. I mean, I don't know totally, but he was an African American. He looked like African American. And then he was like teaching us, If you have like this kind of thing. So this is what Be Well is not about. Be Well is about having a healthy mind. And one of the major causes of depression is when you repress the blood in the front of your brain. And the BT music concentrates blood in your brain stem. That's not where you want your, uh, that's not where you do your good thinking process. Okay, so I know it's interesting, but I have other things to say. Besides music, your uh, common uh, habits for entertainment have a lot to do with your frontal lobe. You have a type of brain wave that you use when you're doing uh, critical thinking. And you have a type of brain wave that you have when you're sleeping. But when you're watching a movie or watching television, your brain very quickly moves into a wave that's similar to sleeping and far from thinking. This is why people pay so much money for ads during videos. Because 
Because those ads have much more power with people. This is why it'd be well that I tell you you must give up your movies and your video games. Now you can watch this yourself. If you ask someone, he will tell you he gets pleasure from his movies. He will tell you he gets pleasure from his uh, video games. But can separate the people that watch movies and play video games from those who don't. And see who has happiness and who has depression. Many people that are addicted to games end up losing interest in life. But useful work creates a zest for life. But what if you have both? Useful work and games. The games create a distaste for the useful work. So I say to the man, those entertainments you're chasing are reducing your capacity to enjoy life. That's a frontal lobe hit. Have I talked to you about the the dopamine set point? I talked about that. Let's see if I have time. I do. So that dopamine is that neurotransmitter that makes you feel intense pleasure. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that makes you feel intense pleasure. This isn't like melatonin that makes you feel pleasant. That you can't feel this all the time. So in the healthy life, you have melatonin that makes you feel fine, I feel good, I feel good. Then something nice happens and you, that's great! And then you feel good, 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 good. So you don't need dopamine all the time. But you're glad for it. It's nice to have some bright spots in the day. But I want to tell you what happens over time. When you are six years old, you get dopamine when you see the cats chasing each other in the road. You get dopamine when the dog wants to lick you. You get dopamine when your mother smiles at you. That is, it takes very little stimulation to give you a dopamine joy. The amount of stimulation it takes to make you feel that dopamine high is called your dopamine set point. The amount of stimulation it takes to make you feel this goodness, that is your set point. It is your, your standard of how much you need. To, let me try to say it again. Your dopamine set point is the amount of stimulation you need to feel good. Dopamine set point 
Uh, that point is quite small when you're young. But stimulating activities can raise the set point. So the music we were talking about, or pornography, or masturbation, or using marijuana, or watching movies. What happens over time is it becomes harder for you to feel joy. So now smile from your friend doesn't do much for you. Now eating the mango doesn't make you feel too good. And when you get up here, almost nothing makes you feel good. Only using methamphetamines does it. And uh, suicide becomes much more common up here. Because you don't get joy from many things. So what is it that raises the set point? It's what we call super stimulus. What is a super stimulus? It's an addictive stimulus. Those things that stimulate you so much that you must have them, you, you feel bad to not have them, those are super stimuli. You might miss your dog. For your cat, but they're not a super stimulus. You might wish you could have a good papaya, but that's not a super stimulus. Uh, you might uh, want to uh, think of other examples. But those addictive behaviors, they are the super stimulus. And uh, watching movies is certainly addictive. Did any of you ever try giving up movies? Just a couple, maybe four, maybe all of you except the boys. I don't know. Uh, so maybe all of you have, have, have gone through this already. Here's how you can feel the super stimulus of movies. When you have a real conversation with your friend, in one week, it's very fuzzy and hard to remember. But when you watch 10 minutes of the movie, in three months, you can still see it in your head. You understand that that's a super stimulus. And it's raising your set point that makes it harder for you to have joy. So that's, that's really unfortunate. So here are two people. This one really wants to have a happy life. He watches movies. He plays games. He uses pornography. He listens to hard music. 
He sees many ladies besides his wife. He's trying to have a happy life. Here's another man. He doesn't do any of those things. He goes for a walk in the morning. He eats simple food. Here's another man. He doesn't do any of those things. He goes for a walk in the morning. He eats simple food. If they meet, this man might think, this guy has no joy in life. But he doesn't know what he's talking about. This man really enjoys his life. And this man, if he's honest, at age 20 he enjoys his life, but at age 40 he doesn't. What changed? The set point kept getting higher from the stimulation. Set point, When you stop the stimulation, the set point begins to come down again. And you can get to the point where your mother's smile again makes you feel very nice. That makes it easier to resist depression. Any questions about this point? Can you understand how movies relate to the frontal lobe? Okay. This must be easier than these things. No questions. There has been a time when, when me and my friends we used to go to movie theaters and watch movies. And we used to be like so excited about it, like when a new movie comes out, we used to sit down to see it. But then now when I think about it, I don't like once my friend, that friend, like one of those, he said, like, Did you see this new movie? I was like, which one? And then he told me from which. And then I went to when I tried to watch it, I didn't find it enjoyable. Like, I didn't find it like I can continue watching it. Like after watching for like five ten minutes, I felt like I cannot That's continue cool. watching it. So you might say something about that in bond, but then we can reply to I mean, it. I'm on uh I'm just gonna spot this one back on I'm a kitchen board to my book she got আমার <laughs> <laughs> that will help you with these things. Before you do behavior, pray. Ask God to go with you. But if it feels strange to pray, it's probably not a good behavior. <laughs> you understand? Yeah, I mean, you probably don't want to do it. You want to ask God to help you go around the neighborhood. So when we are dealing with depression, there are many impersonal things. But there are some very personal things. And if people will listen to us, they can get out of depression. A big part of it is more lowering the set point for dopamine. Because that way they can get joy all through the day. So when I talk to someone about depression, if I, if I don't have much time, I typically give just 
a few hints of ideas. I'll tell them about sugar. About sleep. About exercise. About guilt. About telling God that you did the wrong thing and asking Him for forgiveness. If they will fix these four things, that will help non clinical depression. That's where we have one, two, or three hits. But if they have clinical depression, then we find a more comprehensive approach. So I'm done now with the summary of depression. We could go into a lot more information about the nutrition part. But I don't want to do it because some of the things you need to buy are hard to buy in Bangladesh. So I think working on the other hits is probably more important. But I have some news for you. I think Be Well is going to start a health food distribution company. So we can make products available to people because right now it's hard to get them. For example, we talk about cancer. And there's a powerful chemical, EGCG. It's mostly in Kara. So we'll be importing Kara to sell here. And many other things. So he replied, hmm. that man? Yes, I've been talking all morning to these people. All right, let me pray for you. Our Father in heaven, help us to help others who are depressed. Give us tact and skill that way. I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.